Hi, my name is Cheryl, CEO of LifeWorks, founder of MyLifeWorks.com and welcome to another session of interview of Conversations with Uncommon Women. Today, we have with us Ms. Patsy Dorr, who is the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion of Thomson Reuters. And she'll be sharing with us her career journey, what were some of the challenges, her criteria for success, and I'm sure you will gain lots of insights. Welcome, Patsy. Thank you. So you've asked me to talk about my career path, and uh, basically, in, in short, I went to university uh, in Virginia after growing up in Manhattan. And I think probably the most important element of that experience is that I was one of the first women in an all-men's college. So it was a 250-year-old university that was all men, and there were 100 women and 1,500 men there. So we had a fantastic opportunity to start from the ground up in terms of building an environment that supported women when I was only 18 years old. I then went actually to graduate on with a BS in biology, so I was always a math and science oriented kid actually, although I've ended up in human resources somewhere along the way. So after university, I ended up going into sales. Uh, I thought I was going to be a doctor, that was my original plan, but I decided at the young age of 22 that I wasn't ready to go to medical school and that I would actually ex explore another angle. So I went into sales, which was always an orientation of mine and has remained so and is definitely a theme throughout my career. And then I ended up going into investment banking at J.P. Morgan. Interestingly enough, I had never taken a business course in my life and nor had I had any exposure to finance, again, because my background was all science and math. And so I was thrown into the trading desk, the derivatives trading desk, and actually asked to develop learning and development programs for the traders. Again, knowing nothing about the product and taking on a new role, we basically built out a learning curriculum for the derivatives university, if you will. And then I ended up building my career in learning and development while at J.P. Morgan. I got my master's at night at Fordham University in adult education and organizational development. And I was able to take what I learned at night and apply it the next day at work. And as I was at J.P. Morgan for about five years, I had a number of different roles in learning and development. I ran the graduate training programs for quite some time, and then I actually started a learning and development function for the audit function. You'll see a theme throughout my career is that pretty much every role that I've ever taken has been a brand new role. So my skill set and my interest is all about building from the ground up. Obviously, it has to be sustainable, but I generally take on new responsibilities so I have the opportunity to build. So after JP Morgan, I was recruited by Deutsche Bank to actually go over to the UK. So I went over to the UK to actually again start a learning and development function for the operations and IT part of the organization, based out of the UK but in a global capacity. I also was asked to develop a graduate training program across Deutsche Bank for the organization and took that on as well. We then came back to the United States at that point and I joined Credit Suisse shortly thereafter. I actually ran learning and development for the investment bank globally. Again, brand new role. The investment bank had zero learning and development. So I basically went in and built an infrastructure and a framework around people development. After doing that for approximately three years, they asked me to run and build leadership development curriculum for our managing directors. And that was basically called our Leadership Institute, which I ran out of New York at that time. And then I had a very interesting conversation with my boss at the time, who was based in Zurich, about my next move. And we basically led a conversation that brought me to Asia rather rapidly. He said, would you have any opportunity to go out to Asia and build the talent function for Credit Suisse? And I said, absolutely, bring it on. So essentially, I dragged the family, my two children, and uh, my husband as well, to go out to Hong Kong and we built a function over the course of five years. So when I arrived, we had two people on the ground. When I left, I had a team of 45. When I arrived, we had about 50 learning and development programs going across the entire region. When I left, we had 2,860 to be exact. Mm -hmm. At that point, I then was recruited to join Thomson Reuters unexpectedly. I wasn't looking to leave Asia, nor was I looking to leave Credit Suisse. But it turned out there was a fabulous opportunity at Thomson Reuters, again, an organization going through a large amount of change. HR was being completely redefined. So the role that I actually signed on for ended up evolving quite a bit. So I initially looked after learning and development. And since then, I've now taken on the responsibility of global diversity and inclusion, in addition to a few other roles that are primarily focused on business development. 
Right, very interesting journey that you have embarked on. Mm -hmm. A couple of things, interesting things I, I picked up from there. First, um, being one of the minority, if you would like to say, uh, female in an immense, in all, almost all men's school. Mm -hmm. How did a female voice get heard? I think there are two ways in which the female voice was heard. Number one, we spent a lot of time connecting with the men and with the alumni. And actually it was a very interesting exercise that led me down the path I took going into a, primarily an all men's industry and in financial services as well. It was really understanding the styles and the thinking of the men at the university and as I said, the alumni as well. I think the second way we were heard is that we really went in and built a number of new initiatives again. One, I'm an athlete, I enjoy sports quite a bit, so we started a basketball team, um, we started a speech team, we started sororities actually from the ground up. So basically we were in an opportunity to build things again from the ground up that actually added value to the university and the university is heavily focused on engagement and alumni connections and so all of these programs actually help build that community. The other interesting th thing that I picked up from what you have shared is that for every one of your role was a brand new role. So share with us what did it take for you to de you know, decide without you know, any doubt that you would jump head in and pursue it with no background in training or experience in that area? Well, generally, my orientation is to thrive on new experiences. And if we were to reflect on adult learning, uh, my learning style is very much about learning from experience. And I also enjoy taking risks, albeit mitigated risks, all within the context of large corporations that were very stable from the beginning, but also had that newness factor to them. And for me, jumping into a new experience is how I learn, how I thrive, where I get my energy from, and actually what inspires me on a daily basis. So what made you go ahead was because it inspired you? It, it sort of ignited in you a new energy and excitement in that. You know? So in, in the current context, many of us perhaps have, do not have the opportunity to jump into something new. What do you think, in your opinion, we can do to ignite that passion within us, having the same role that we are in? I think it's, I, I have a strong philosophy on this, and I think it's very much about playing to your strengths. I think it's really important for people to understand what their strengths are and what their development areas are, and to leverage those strengths. So once you have that understanding, take them to the next level, take the risks associated with them, and really focus on how can I actually develop my strength as opposed to my development areas. And that's what served me well over the years. I know what I'm good at, I know what I'm not so good at as well. And I think you know, my ability to, to influence and to generate new ideas is what has given me the confidence to jump into new roles and experiences. Right. Was it uh, deliberate? I could say that some of your moves were not deliberate, right? that the opportunity presented itself. Mm -hmm. So at each point in time when the opportunity presented itself, what do you learn of yourself and in making the decision, for example, to move your family to a different country altogether, mm -hmm. what were the, the thoughts that went through your mind and how do you help transit the rest of the people who were making, you know, making that change with you? Well, it definitely was a process for the family to, to move overseas to Asia unexpectedly. And par part of that was I saw the opportunity, and you're right, these were presented to be unexpectedly, but I saw the opportunity and the importance of a global mindset. I've always had global roles over the course of my entire career, and so I've always felt it was important to actually have those live experiences on the ground. It's quite different to live somewhere than to just travel there for short periods of time. And I think that translates also to my children, who've now had this incredible experience overseas, experiencing a number of different cultures, and it shaped their personalities as well. So those were the ways I looked at it from both a personal and a professional perspective, and those are the conversations that I had with the family and at work to really make it happen. Right, so it sounds like family does play a huge role in the choices that you make and, and helping them to transit. So the big question right now in uh, lots of people's minds is in terms of work-life navigation, work-life integration. So how do you manage your work and non-work commitments given that you love sports and you have a family and you are running a global role? How do you keep yourself sane? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Sanity, sanity is important. Um, it's very similar to my philosophy on leveraging your strengths. I think it's important to know your boundaries and your limits and what you actually need and want. 
and I know that I need variety in my life. I know I need to be with my family. I know I need to work and excel at my work. I also know that socializing is very important to me as well. And so I've built a system to allow us to have that to happen. You know, when that involves the babysitting scenario, which is obviously very different in New York than it is in Asia, but we've been able to build that scenario to allow us to have that type of flexibility, but also to have flexibility in my role so that I can make it to some of the children's events. I can't make it to all of them. I know that. My children accept that. But I can make it to as many as possible because there's a certain amount of flexibility in my role that allows me to build my own schedule. And that's something that's happened over time. So flexibility was one of the key strategy that you had and making the ask to your supervisors. So for some of us, that is the barrier, right? The ability to even begin to make that ask. What advice would you have for individuals who, who knows that they need the flexibility, but where should I begin, Betsy? Okay. Well, I think there's two ways to look at it. First of all, make it happen. And I think you've got to build the trust, right? As a manager myself, I've had individuals working with me who've worked in flexible arrangements, and they can do it because I trust them, because they deliver. So you've A, got to build that trust to begin with. You can't expect you're going to get it overnight. Number two, I think you really need to think about what is a scenario that could actually work. There are some roles that work flexibly, there are some that do not. So you want to set yourself up for success and really have a strong think about what are those factors that are driving me individually, what are the factors that my manager needs, how, do, how comfortable are they with me as an individual and also with this particular role, and find a solution that works for both of you that's practical and has clear outcomes. Right. Sounds easy, but I think together the momentum and to build that foundation is going to be the key piece to build that trust and credibility with your supervisor. Um, shifting gears a little in terms of elements of success, how would you define success for your career or in, in life? What would your definition of success be? Also a very interesting question that I've thought about quite a bit as unfortunately I'm getting older. Um, although I don't like to admit that. Over the years, I originally defined success very much about upward movement, and I was always thriving and striving for the next bigger, bigger role. That's still important to me, and I still believe that I want and wish to be on a trajectory over the next several years. I don't plan on ever retiring, um, or maybe someday. But I think that's really important to actually have that, have that clarity in terms of the trajectory. But I also think it's about doing work that inspires you. And that's one of the things that I've really discovered, frankly, in this diversity and inclusion role that I've taken on, is just the passion behind it and actually enjoying this responsibility and the reward that comes from it is really unprecedented in my view. And I think that's what really helps me think about success for the future. Right. Given your, you know, you, you play on a global arena, what are some of the trends? What's one trend, let's say, that you're seeing about women and women in the workplace and what can women do about it? I think it's important to note that the skills required to be successful in the global workplace are evolving and they're changing. There's a lot of research out there right now about the new professional, which is very much about understanding cultural norms, how they apply to work. Again, this whole concept of being a global citizen, I think that's a really critical element to anyone's success, anybody starting now in the middle of their career or even moving forward to build that component into your own development so that's a core skill set. I think the other trend that we're seeing is that people want to have more choice. This gets back to the flexible arrangements. So whether you're an employee or a manager, to make sure that the environment that you work has some element of flexibility to it. Mm, okay. Now, if you were given a chance to address a thousand women who was about to graduate and step into the workplace, what is the one piece of advice you would like to speak to the younger generation? My advice, and I do a lot of work with women in high school right now, I'm actually on the board of an all-girls school and I do some work with my own high school as well on this topic. The main piece of advice, if I had to summarize it in one line, would be to say yes. Say yes before you say no with any opportunity that's presented to you. Think about the reasons why not after you've said yes and then make it work. Right, so say yes. I would then assume that the next time that we invite you for other conversations, you would say yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Patsy, for sharing with us your thoughts. 
and I want you to thank Patsy by sharing your love and giving us your comments and you know, let her know what you feel about what she has shared in the comments below and I look forward to the next conversations with Uncommon Women with you. This is Cheryl from MyLifeWorks.com. See you at the next interview.